Big thanks to Indie Gamer Chick, Galaxy Trail, and Sony for providing the code to Freedom Planet, which allowed me to make this video for IGC Party. Part of the goal is to help spread the word about indie titles that may not have gained the traction they deserve. It's also about offering feedback that's easily searchable for the developers themselves, which as an illustrator I know can be an invaluable resource at times. And on top of that, this specific event is also designed to raise awareness for the Epilepsy Foundation, which works to raise money for epilepsy research, is involved in training people to recognize when someone may be having an epileptic attack so they can administer first aid properly, and more. Links to all of the above in the description, including the Epilepsy Foundation, if you feel so inclined to donate. The IGC party or one of the many other events hosted each year is something you can take part in too, if you want. You don't have to be an established critic or anything to earn a code. You need only follow the few simple rules, which you can find at the Indie Gamer Chick Twitter. The event is still going on for the next few days, so check it out if you're interested. The game I'm looking at for this event is Freedom Planet for the PS4. This isn't going to be a full review as of yet, because I'm not comfortable doing a full review of a game I haven't exhausted to a pretty thorough degree, but I can still hopefully give my overall impressions of the time I've spent with the game thus far. As some of you may know, Freedom Planet originally started life as a Sonic the Hedgehog fan game. Eventually, it transitioned into being its own product, and has gained a pretty decent following, who are all now anxiously awaiting the sequel. It's probably obvious that I chose to look at this game largely because of how much experience I have with 2D Sonic games, but beyond that, I've had one previous experience with Freedom Planet, which left me surprisingly disappointed, so this was a good opportunity to go back and maybe see if there was something I missed. And actually, yeah, there was. You know how often I talk about playing a game on its terms, learning its language of play? Because of the knowledge I had telling me it was supposed to be like a Sonic game, I read Freedom Planet wrong the first time I tried to play it, and didn't get on the level it wanted me to be on. Freedom Planet does have a decent amount in common with Sonic, but it also surprisingly has a lot in common with Rocket Knight. Not really sure why I didn't see that before, considering Rocket Knight Adventures for the Genesis was next to Echo the Dolphin as one of the first games I ever actually played on a regular basis, in preschool over two decades ago, but I've played it since then. It took me a bit to get used to not trying to roll down hills with the first character I chose in Freedom Planet, but once I started using the game's mechanics more thoroughly, the fun started to sink in. Combining Sonic's design with Rocket Knight's might sound strange at first, but it works surprisingly well. Your characters now have health bars, and a meter used to perform special actions. The meter recharges over time, meaning you're never left out to dry if you make a few mistakes. All of these changes are in service of introducing combat into the speed you'll find in Sonic. Characters have several different ways of attacking enemies, and many enemies take more than one hit to take down, or need to be hit in certain weak points. At face value, these two ideas don't really go well together. After all, trying to run extremely fast without the protection of rolling into a ball at will seems like it would be a nightmare any time you run into an enemy, let alone one that takes more than one hit to kill. But there are a few small tricks that make it so that your momentum doesn't have to be halted if you want to just keep sprinting on your way. Firstly, most of your actions also double up as attacks, like a short boost you can perform, or a double jump. On top of that, having a bar of life instead of dying anytime you don't have rings or whatever lessens the impact of mistakes you make, and allows you to make more of them. My favorite, more subtle design choice though, comes from the fact that you can actually run right through many of the enemies you come across. Instead, only the more dangerous parts of them will hurt you if you make contact, like spikes or projectiles. This allows you to avoid taking damage just from touching an enemy while you're sprinting your way through a level. This creates a really cool dynamic where you can seamlessly move between using your moveset for going fast, using it for exploration, and using it for combat, without missing a beat. Now I've still had a few issues thus far. 
the two main ones coming down to the length of the levels and the danger of some attacks being hard to read. This boss here has an attack where they swiftly strike their claws through the ground, which is dangerous enough on its own, but it took me a while to realize why I was still taking damage from this attack even when I'd avoided it. Turns out that the rocks it digs out of the ground are also considered projectiles, which I think needed a bit better conveyance. This other boss here, as far as I can tell, can't actually hurt you. When he's jumping across, you can pretty much phase through him completely as far as I can tell. It's a little strange because it looks like he's trying to attack you, but actually it's the green substance he's swimming in that hurts you, so that's the only thing you have to worry about avoiding. The other issue is the length of the levels, which often can go for 10-15 to 15 minutes without doing much exploring. This isn't a problem on its own. More so, my issue stems from the fact that the levels feel really long so far. For me personally, it kind of throws off the pacing, which is only worsened because sometimes you can expect 10 minutes or more of cutscenes in between levels. However, there's one important thing I haven't mentioned, which does a good job of alleviating this problem, and that's the amount of options this game has. Not only can you play as at least three different characters with their own abilities, two of which you start with, but you can also choose to do things like play the game without any of the cutscenes. If you really just want to play it like a classic 16-bit title, you can. Just having that alternative can make all the difference, particularly for quick play sessions after you've exhausted the game's core content and list of collectibles, which there are a lot of. Though even still, if you choose the adventure mode, you can skip cutscenes in their entirety. As of now, the only other thing I have to mention is how gorgeous the game can be at times. Seriously, the parallax scrolling going on here? Mmm, mmm, so good. Anyway, have any of you guys played Freedom Planet? What are your thoughts on it? Are you looking forward to the sequel? Let me know in the comments below, and I'll see you next time.